Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Mark Provisa. I'm the moderator for today's session. We have a very relevant topic. It's the impact on the commercial and residential UK markets, with particular regard to investments, development and financing. Now, um, we come to the stage where we're all emerging out of the darkness now into the light. And we have a very interesting uh, set of panelists today. Just to run through them very briefly, we have Neville Kahn, who's the founding partner of Blandford Capital. We have uh, Ben Barbanel, who is the head of debt finance at Oak North, uh, at Oak North Bank. When we have Kate Davis, who joined um, and is the chief executive of Notting Hill Genesis, and has been such, I think, since 2004. So all are highly experienced panelists. And um, we're going to start the session by asking the, the obvious and starting point. But I would ask that each panelist very briefly uh, a little bit more about yourself so people understand. So the kickoff is how does the current residential and commercial market differ today than that distant pre-COVID lockdown? Um, Neville, since you're at the top. Hi, um, th thanks Mark and thanks Hugo also for, for, for putting this on. Um, I'm Neville, uh, Neville Khan from Blanford Capital. Until two years ago, for the prior 32 years, I was on the professional services side uh, with PwC and Deloitte leading the restructuring, turnaround and m and practices. So hopefully I've got a bit of a benefit of seeing it both from a, an advisory side but also as an investing side um, right now. I, I think the simple answer is the one of uncertainty. Um, as we go through the next period, it's you know what will happen because to be candid, we don't have a vaccine and we don't you know, have the prospects of something very quickly. It's the uncertainty in how that's going to affect the market, whether it be commercial residential market. And so I think that's the thing that we've all got to sort of work through as we talk about the new norm is we've got to be more flexible and we've got to be getting used to much more uncertainty in the markets. Okay. Hi, my name's Kate Davis. I run a large housing association. If you don't know what they are, they are providing um, low cost and supported housing for people in need. And over recent years, we've had to uh, enter the commercial field in order to generate resources to do this as government grants have uh, reduced significantly. We've been in existence since the 1960s with a start in the Notting Hill area but now we work across the whole of London and we do a wide range of additional services including student housing, care for older people, um, commercial, um, PRS um, and shared ownership. So uh, you know a wide range of residential uh, offerings. So what's the impact of of COVID, nobody could disagree with what Neville said about uncertainty, but I think for me, what was already going on has been intensified by COVID. It isn't as if COVID is a kind of ground zero event. COVID is grafted onto a very difficult place in the property market, I think. There was already a significant change around uh, Brexit and changes in the, um, the funding of housing and the tax regime. Uh, making it much more difficult to sell property in central London in particular, but London as a whole. Um, some real question marks about what's happening with pricing, uh, real insecurity about London's future in the world post-Brexit, and already before COVID, a change in the way we work and the way we shop. And both of these have affected the, uh, the market of pro in property. Put COVID on top of that, and it's basically speeded up exponentially some of the effects, particularly around shops and offices, I think. And there will also be an impact on housing and how we live. Thank you. Ben? ben? Hi, good morning. Ben Barbanel, um, Oak North Bank. We are a relatively new challenger bank in the UK. Uh, we got our banking license in 2015. 
we were the third new bank in over 150 years to be granted a license in the UK. Uh, since then, we've lent nearly four and a half billion pounds. Um, a large portion of that is into real estate. Um, very pleased to say that to date we haven't lost a penny. Uh, who knows what happens uh, post, post COVID, uh, but hopefully uh, that will be something I'll be able to say for a long time. Um, I think the only thing I would, I, I I would add that, that slightly differs to, to those two comments is, I think the fundamentals in the residential market remain of a huge um, undersupply um, in terms of um, supply and demand. I think locations of, of um, residential housing will clearly change going forward. Um, we have dynamics such as parking all of a sudden becoming uh, more in vogue again because less people will want to use public transport. Um, and you know, will there be a drive out of city centres into more uh, partly rural locations? Possibly. What does that mean for the high street in terms of some of the narrative you would have read around converting that into residential? Not sure. Let's see. Uh, I think on the commercial side, I think the, 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 the onset of COVID has, has almost changed significantly the balance of power towards the tenant. And all of a sudden, the tenant feels they have the upper hand in their relationship with their landlord, rather than the landlord being the big bad wolf and being able to dictate to the tenant all through their lease. Um, the, 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 the tenant all of a sudden has the ability to, to pay rent or not pay rent, uh, currently with the government's support. That's, um, that's only lasts for a specific period of time. But sure. I, I agree with you, I think what's gonna happen is there is going to be a balancing shift or a shift in balance between tenant and landlord, and it will be the tenants who start dictating. But I want to pick up a, another question on this. Um, in what ways do you actually see these markets adapting and changing? Is there is going to be a specific change in attitude by um, landlords as to terms of length of leases? Um, what is your view on that generally, the panelists? In coming to that point, Mark, can I disagree with you and, 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 and agree with Ben? Because this, the balance of power going to uh, going to the to, to the tenant, I, I don't think it's short term. I, my view, this is the real estate industry catching up from what we've seen in many many industries now over the last probably one or two decades, where the customer, the power has become to the customer rather than the supplier. Um, we saw it, I think, in retail, where, to be candid, retailers used to be able to give the customers what they thought they want. And now, with so much choice, the customers um, are, are king. You see it in automotive, where all of a sudden, some of those relationships have completely flipped around. And so I, I happen to think that this is, this is not a temporary change. And so, therefore, I think it's something that you know, the balance is, it has swung, it may come back a little bit to, but I think it's more permanently now to, 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 the, uh, to, to the tenants. So therefore, if that's correct, the change in attitudes that you ask for has to be, if people have to just think about it. I don't think landlords can be there as, as confident as they were that, you know, everything will be okay. They need to think about what the new norm is there and it's 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 those who will make considerable amount of gains because they will adapt and so i think they'll be innovative they'll adapt and something different has to happen okay uh i agree a lot with what neville just said certainly in the social housing world we expect our tenants to be active and to be demanding and to be included in our decision making um i think the uh, Black Lives Matter is showing that there is some pressure in the country for people to have more power, more representation and more democracy. And I think that's probably here to stay. And I think it's a good thing. I think it's related to social media. Uh, the issue of choice, though, with property is quite a quite a difficult one, because, um, you know, if you look at the output of most of the big house builders, 
the design and style of the housing is very traditional. It hasn't really modernized in a long time. We haven't really had the technological change that has happened, say, in car making or, or many, many aspects of British industry. And the uh, modular housing world is only just coming into existence, really. It's still more or less a cottage industry. So I think the, the whole question of consumer demand, market research, a much greater appreciation of what people want is very important, but I dampen and temper that with the issue of affordability. Um, there is a very real crisis in the social housing and in the market housing world in that very few people can afford to buy without significant help from the family. And uh, therefore the ability of us to let housing and to sell housing is undermined by its price which is obviously a market price and is also affected by many, many things, uh, risk, uh, the cost of land, uh, planning permission, uh, requirements and so on. But the ability of most people to meet their own housing needs from their own pocket is uh, very significantly challenged in, in the UK and particularly in the south of the UK today. And I think that is a uh, really worrying situation for us as a country. Does that mean in some ways that there'll be a change maybe to instead of ownership, pure rental or, you know, which is the sort of French and German model in many cases? Yeah, I mean, in Germany, they restrict the rental uh, as a percentage of average wages. So the, in most parts of Germany, it's around 20% of income. We're here, even just a room in a shared house can be half of someone's income so it you know the it works well in Germany because it is the norm and there is a depression of the market by uh, local and state uh, regimes and that, that's pretty common in Europe I think in the UK our house prices are very much higher compared to salaries than they are as far as I know anywhere in in Europe and therefore uh, rent people are going into the market rent. We have a big market rent subsidiary with over a thousand homes. And at the moment we have larger voids than we've ever had. Um, people are just doing uh, things like living at home with their parents, uh, living in shared houses and commuting relatively long distances. I think the, the interesting thing about COVID is it throws up into the air this idea of a nine to five job in town with commuting attached. Yeah, we'll, touch on that. we'll touch on that in a minute. Yeah. And your views? Um, uh, yeah, similar. I mean, I think the, um, the con ultimately this gives, this accelerates consumer choice. So, you know, consumers will, will consumers, tenants will have a stronger, a stronger hand than they've had previously. Um, and you know, I don't. Ultimately, I don't think that's a bad thing. Uh, but as Kate says, you know, a lot of this is about affordability and ability to to, to pay. But we we get on to the scenario, which I know we briefly discussed a few days back, where particularly the younger generation wanted to have inner urban living, uh, cafes, trendy uh, shops, and little restaurants and pop-ups and all the rest of it, the commute was reduced, etc. Now that a lot of people have been living sort of cheek to jowl with their partners or spouses or whoever, um, and all those extras that went with it have been closed, I'm detecting certainly amongst the people of my children's generation, um, a desire to actually want a bit more space suddenly and to come into the view that maybe the suburbs aren't as awful as everybody makes out and that, that gives them space, it gives them the ability to work uh, from home in a less cramped environment and maybe get some, you know, a bit of garden or something. Do you, do you think that's probably right? Are you picking up that sentiment, anybody? Neville? Ben? Kate? Yeah, yeah. I think, uh, uh, on, I think I... Yeah, I think I am. I think it's probably a little bit early to say so far, um, but I think the drive out of central locations will will probably be a theme that we see over the next years, for sure. Uh, for, for me, I think the, the other critical part of this is about transport. 
Yeah, right now, I suspect most people on this call are somewhat fearful of taking public transport. And you've seen how yeah, most of the, the big offices, you know, are having to have sort of, you know, well, very slow to ask people to come back. And in some, you know, they've got different teams in or out of the office at any time and saying, well, you know, we're not going to force you to, 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 to go on public transport. And for me, that's the you know, most critical thing is, is how, how we, we get our heads around that. Um, well, we did it up to a point when the bombs started going off on the tubes. Within a day or two, I mean, the British public was back on the tubes, which I thought was incredible. Um, it may be that provided there's no second wave in a, in a really horrible way, that people will just adapt again and take their chances on public transport. But I agree, I, th I think it's going to be an issue. But I also think employers will be very wary of, to be candid, of encouraging employees in, and, 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 and rightly so, because they've got to make sure they're not being pushed into coming against the world, etc. So, so, I don't know, I, I think that's one of, for, 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 the, for London, that's clearly going to be one of the, the, very, the very biggest challenges for kick-starting the, 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 the London economy and hence the London sort of real estate market particularly for commercial. Okay, for a number of people who are probably listening in, and I, I recognise names from both Israel, Asia, um, I saw Holland in there and a few others. Um, and these are going to be people who are looking or advising or generally involved in the investment world in the UK. So I'm really thinking what markets are going to be more adversely affected? You have development investment, rental, retail, student accommodation, which are just a few examples. Um, which ones do you think are going to actually really get hit in the next year or two? And that you'd be looking at very closely if you wanted, if you're thinking of investing. I think retail has, has you know, been hugely accelerated towards the end of its popularity. I think, you know, as, as Kate said earlier, COVID has, has, has just um, accentuated that. Uh, it was clearly on a downward trend. Um, you know, the fact, that, the fact that people would have been using online delivery services and Amazon, et cetera, more than ever, um, and realizing how convenient they were um, has, 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 has meant that, you know, retail will, will taper off, I'm sure. And, you know, in the last few days alone, we've lost a couple of high profile names that we've all been accustomed to seeing on the high street. You've got John Lewis announcing a whole strategic review of their retail operations. You know, these are names that have been around for hundreds and hundreds of years. Um, so, you know, retail is, is the one for me that's, that's not going not gonna to fare well in all of this. Yeah. Um, and so you can imagine that as planned for capital, we're, you know, we're a mid-market private investment office dealing with turnarounds and hopefully growth. Yeah, we've seen, every day we're seeing retail, every day we're seeing casual dining uh, that are just being, I mean, like being obliterated through it. Um, and anything is really, really tough. Um, I think certain types of leisure will definitely sort of be, you know, more robust, like sort of, the, the cinemas and stuff, they, they will come back. But uh, yeah, every day it's retail. From a real estate perspective, it's retail and it's leisure and anything to do with hospitality, for sure. And would you be looking to, do you think there's an opportunity to buy development sites, either residential or commercial? I think, um, I mean, we're very much still in the market. We have a land bank of about 8,000 plots, which we're building out steadily. Um, we're looking for good opportunities as, as such as they are out there at the moment. We definitely think London's got a future, no doubt about it, and people will need places to live. Um, I think the, the residential, which is less popular at the moment and going to be really in trouble, is a sort of very smart inner city, uh, relatively small flats that have been sold to middle-class people who are used to living in either the suburbs or the country with a nice big home and a garden. 
they've been convinced to buy small flats uh, where they can drink champagne on the terrace and overlook this sort of urban environment. I think the shine has definitely gone off that. Um, oh, there you go, Mark. No good for that then. <laughs> uh, the thing I think for me, what I'm reassessing is the opportunity for refurbishment. I think small houses in the suburbs with a garden, three or four bedrooms are underpriced and I'm buying up quite a lot at the moment and want to do more refurbished. I think they've got a long life ahead of them, either for family living or for sharers. Um, so I think the big high rise, we've had so much trouble with high rise in terms of building quality, uh, safety and so on. Um, students, who knows what's going to happen to the student market. I think a lot more student education is going to be online and irregularly coming together rather than daily, the nine to five situation. So I think every, every family, every organization, every company, and probably every country is thinking about what does the future look like? And I think there's some time for some very radical thinking. The people who get ahead with the radical thinking I think we'll be doing well. I've always felt having a home with an office in it and an office that's a bit like home with some home comforts is a completely stupid use of landmass, particularly as we've got shortage of it in the UK. Having working from home as a centre of our community with opportunities for social life and hubs and cooperation and collaboration within it has to be the new design. We're living in cities that the Victorians designed with a bit of help from people during the 1930s. This is not the modern cities of the future and they are going to have to be different. I think it's going to come also with a re-evaluation for a number of the generations as to what they really want out of life. Do they really want to be working flat out from an office to our commute each way and all the rest of it. Um, and, you know, is the money that important? It's good. It's, it's, it is important. But how much of that is also going to be you watch the kids starting to grow up and things like that. Mm -hmm. And that's going to influence things. I just want to ask, if you were looking to lend or invest, what markets would you be looking at? What asset classes would you be looking at now? Is one that comes obviously to my mind, but I'm curious to see if it comes to yours. I mean, I think look, the um, the 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 demographics for me in the UK are such that residential remains a, a strong growth asset class. Again, you know, location may be changing, but but uh, the principle isn't going anywhere. And then you know, the obvious ones around um, last mile logistics, light industrial, those sorts of things. Uh, with the increase of uh, online online shopping, etc., I think that will be a winner as well. Um, oh, sorry, it's not. No, no. Sorry, I, I don't know what I've done wrong. I'm going to try and come back in. Okay, we think you're in, by the way, Kate. But so I'll, I'll answer. I'll, I'll go next whilst you're because we can still see you. So, so certainly at Blandford, I mean things that we're looking at. So. We are investing in, for instance, in nursery schools. Um, and when you, when you see that as a sector, um, obviously it's been hit by the last few months. Um, however, you need for whether you're working from home or whether you are you know, commuting, you know, the need to be able to have good uh, a child care in place, I think is, is a great long-term place into it. So we're investing there and expect to see quite a lot of opportunities come through there. Um, uh, I, I, the other interesting thing from just more generally, I think we're gonna see a change in, which may benefit the UK economy, is the sort of it's a, a move away from globalization. I think one of the things that uh, this sort of last sort of six months have, have shown us is that, um, the need to have supply and supply chains and the benefit of having short supply chains and therefore near shoring. So I think it's going to be really, really interesting from a UK manufacturing perspective that, you know, once you're through the weak ones not being able to survive coming back out of it, you may well see a concentration much closer to home, which therefore if you're if you're in the real estate and you know in industrials etc actually i think you'll see that come back because you know, when you just see the lack of globalization in a 
of the global approach to COVID. Yeah, the US, not always the best example, right? And, you know, making sure that supplies are, are you know, onshore. Um, people are, are really looking much closer to home. So once we come through this, I would keep an eye out on the industrials as well, because I think there could be a, uh, a reinvigoration of the UK manufacturing as well. Anybody got any views on senior care? Yes, I have. I mean, we, we provide about uh, homes for about 800 people. Um, it has been absolutely hell to deal with COVID. Um, everything the government says is not true. Uh, most of the providers tried their very best uh, to get organized, to get PPE, to get their staff into work by paying them uh, additional money, uh, trying to get them in by taxi when there wasn't any uh, proper transport available. And mainly we've been able to keep our people safe, <clears throat> mainly by isolating them within their own individual rooms or flats and getting rid of all the communal facilities that they have relied on, whether it's eating together or community activities and so on. So we have kept people alive and safe and we've done very well at Nottingham Genesis. I'm proud of that. But the cost of doing that is well beyond what the local government uh, um, commissioners are prepared to pay. So long term, I'm looking at either coming out completely because it won't be properly paid for or trying to force a settlement from the government and local government to pay for it. If you're talking about a better off person paying for their own care, perhaps there is an opportunity for some sort of co-living, some kind of supported housing uh, opportunities for people. But I really think one of the reflections during COVID is, will we be happy to put our older people in this sort of setting with other older people where a problem like COVID spreads very quickly? Or would we rather keep them at home despite the difficulties involved in that, either within their own home or to come into the family um, and to have, have uh, families um, join together? I don't think, I think it's a massive issue for the country, but I don't think anyone has got a clue on how to deal with it. If I was thinking about uh, investment, I'd be thinking of technology, so people could be cared for within their own home. So we can check on mum by looking at her on the, on the computer or the television. We can um, urge her to take her medication, check she's okay, she's up and about, rather than people popping in for 15 minutes, traveling in cars or across public transport to get to people in their homes. So I think I would be looking very seriously at tech. I'd also be looking very seriously at modular construction. Uh, particularly for housing, the skills that we are losing already through the aging, skilled population of work, workmen, and also, of course, the Brexit effect. I think we must go into modular for housing and begin to pr produce the kind of quality and quantity of homes that we need. Can I ask a question on uh, lending? Um, how do you feel on the principle of supporting small UK businesses who come to you? I understand that's part of your portfolio and your rationale. Is that correct? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, look, the um, it's what it's what we do. It's what we've done. Uh, it's what we continue to do. I think the government has been phenomenal in um, getting their lending schemes off the ground and and out, enabling. Um, liquidity in the market to be maintained um, you know they've they've got three or four different different schemes available depending on the size of business you are um, and you know they've done a great job in ensuring that there's plenty of banks that are able to deploy cash um, via those schemes you know I think what what's what's really clear mark is that there's there's businesses that are viable with debt and there's businesses that aren't viable with debt and therefore, you know, what the government has done and what they've been very careful to do is ensure that banks aren't just throwing money around without any responsibility. Hence, they've asked banks to, to keep a portion of the risk themselves. Um, you know, some of these businesses just aren't viable without equity. And, and that's a challenge. Um, but, you know, if I'm honest, that's not a challenge for the banks to pick up and deal with. You know, banks lend money that, that, is, that is generally from depositors uh, and the Bank of England um, undertakes to repay those depositors if banks, if banks get it ultimately wrong. 
Um, so, you know, I think a lot of the a lot of the narrative has been around banks not lending money over the last few years. You know, they're lending money, they're not providing equity, which they've never meant they've never meant to be doing. And that that now is 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 more in the spotlight and more of an issue. Great, thank you. Um, Mark, on, on that, I think you know, what we're seeing at Blanford is that it's, it's very interesting. By the way, I totally agree with you, Ben. I think the government, some of the things they put in place with through lending and furlough has been superb. From a financial perspective, financial support perspective, they've done brilliantly. Um, but what we're seeing in the deal flow that we're coming through, because we, you know, we sort of invest right across the, 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 the capital structure, whether it be debt or equity, we are seeing so many people still coming to us now for debt, but really it's equity. Um, and I think we've got a little bit of way to go for the market to really understand that you can't expect the, the debt providers to provide you know, what they're asking for at those margins. It's just unrealistic for the risk that they're being asked to take. So I think as we come out, that will change, but right now, I think there's a bit of a mismatch of uh, expectations in some of the markets. Okay, I just want to remind the attendees, there is a question and answer facility here. And I was looking at some of the questions that are thrown up. And one actually I thought I really liked actually, which was before COVID, if you asked us, you know, what's going to happen, we're all doomed, etc. It was really all about Brexit. And we've seemed to have forgotten Brexit entirely in all of this. Um, and yet, it's actually looming up pretty fast. Uh, you know, this was all about where well, the economy is going to be stuffed and you have different views. And, but I mean, how many people talk about Brexit? You know, I sit around a table or I go on a Zoom, etc. And we're all talking COVID. Nobody's talking Brexit. And yet, I'm fairly certain that that's going to impact as well. So I'm curious to know what the panellists think. Kate? I think Brexit is really important and I've been <clears throat> thinking about it and worrying about it quite a lot because I've just had this sneaky suspicion that the government are going to go, oh, well, COVID's so abysmal, let's just shove uh, quick, uh, quick and dirty hard Brexit through and nobody will really notice. Um, certainly, there doesn't seem to be fantastic progress on getting to a good, a good solution, but I think at the end of the day, we'll have some kind of mashed together solution that will be you know, not great, but, but okay, and life will go on. I mean, we always like to uh, worry about what might happen, and then what happens is often a lot better than what we expected. I sort of feel that's going to be the situation with Brexit. I've hated the idea of it for so long. I can't imagine life outside Europe, but I can now, and I think it's going to happen. Um, but it's yet another uh, damaging impact on the British economy and I think we've got a lot of things that aren't going well for us um, and at the times like this you need very good leadership. I don't think we have. I, I don't disagree with Neville that Rishi Sunak's package was very rapid and very helpful but I think we're going to pay that for a long pay, pay that back for a long period to come and I don't feel really good about the future of the UK economy. One just small point is about how keen people will be to go back to spending lots of money. Um, at the moment, the indication is that people will probably uh, spend about half of what they have in terms of their disposable income. If people start saving in the UK, that's a very interesting change around from what we've had. Uh, but I just think people probably will be, uh, overall, the population will be a lot poorer as a result of, of both COVID followed by Brexit. And I think that will have significant social implications for us as a country. Neville? Um, well, my 93-year-old father is still talking about Brexit. Um, I'm not, I, I, my sense is, having been through what we've been through, the likelihood of a hard Brexit is probably higher rather than lesser, because it, you sort of think, well, if we've been through this and we're thinking about the huge effect of COVID's had, whilst a hard Brexit is clearly not what anyone wants, but it's only really the tip on everything else. So I'm fearful of that because I don't think hard Brexit will be good. But I uh, said, so that, you know, that will be a worry. But maybe given 
what the world's been through and not some sentence to the politicians to stop mucking around and just get a deal done. Ben? Um, I think, I think as Neil says, we're going, we're going down the hard Brexit route, unfortunately. And I think the, um, you know, I think the, almost the, the compensatory factor for, for, for the world is that, well, you know, look how, look how we got through COVID uh, as a community, look what we can do together. Um, and I think that will be the, uh, I think that will be the messaging. I agree with that. Um, I think a lot of this is going to happen. We've been in isolation. Isolation equals hard Brexit. What's the real difference? How can it get any worse in real terms? So I think some politicians are going to take advantage of this and push through a harder Brexit without, on the basis that the majority of the population haven't thought about Brexit for a while and it's out of their minds. So, you know, it's, it's, it's another piece of bad news we can bury and just get on with it. So, yeah, and I think that will have quite a radical effect. Um, I want to know about terms, if, if in commercial property, in any shape of property, if you're going to take a long lease now, I think long leases are probably dead, but you may disagree with this. Um, but if you're a tenant, you, you've got a decent quality building, you've got eight floors or six floors, Renewal's coming up, you're going to think to yourself, do I really need six floors? And I think that may well be a radical change that people will shrink and factor in as well the, uh, the ability to work from your office, which is not such a terrible thing for a lot of people. It's more a statement than a question, I suppose, but what is your view? Anybody? It's obvious, isn't it, that we are going to use less office space. I mean, uh, we were a nine to five company, most people working from the office. We're now 80% uh, working from home. The rest are working in the community and the care homes and doing repairs for people. But nobody really, I think in an office, we used to have uh, about 2000 people in the offices. I think we had 27 on Friday. And that's people who really can't work from home and are really desperate to work from the office. We're not gonna insist on people coming back nine to five to work in offices. Therefore, we're gonna need less office space. And I'm expecting to sell of my seven offices, about four of them. If we don't sell them, maybe we'll turn them into housing. Um, there's, there's no need for, for having people sat in offices and I don't think it's very good for them. It's not very good for communities. And this is somebody who would never ever work from home and I hated the idea been complete change around in my feelings and of course there's a big saving to be made from not running all these offices and having hundreds of people running around ordering stationery. Um, Do you well, that productivity just to add to that? Neville? Productivity Sorry? is probably increased. Uh, it, I uh, think it's better. Uh, yeah I mean well, one of the questions I noticed on the chat was around we work and I think this is those types of models and flex models so uh, um, I think that's going to be interesting. Look, that was a market that was oversupplied, in my, in, in my view. However, a lot of people are going to think about, well, actually, yeah, I don't need to have my, my big lease up there, a long-term lease and cramming people in. But if there, if there are good temporary offices type spaces, um, which I can come in, whether it for, be for meetings. So that whole meeting environment, I think, is, is going to be very interesting. Um, because you do want people to come. How are we going to produce that sort of camaraderie, those cultures that we have had that have been built around physical presence? So I'm, I'm look, it's going to be under strain because yes, there'll be less people coming in, but I think that's where it's going to be interesting that space is going to be used differently. Um, and I would, I would imagine some of those we workplaces I actually think about uh, that can, can, can actually uh, uh, work a little bit better for us once people got confidence to come in. So I think some of those areas, maybe not 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 in the centre of London, like sort of you know, the Camdens of this world, which is much more commutable. Uh, you know, one of my partners has got a, a, a flexible office business there. Well, actually, I think people would want to be thinking about going there. Maybe you can commute into Camden a lot easier than you can. To, to, to Sorry to interrupt. You used the WeWork model, uh, you are referred to WeWork, which is a model that actually I think is not um, 
not necessarily going to work because of the way it was structured. I think they took a head lease and then they granted subleases. Um, I yeah, think I'm, I'm really using it. They uh, work for different types of models where you've got uh, the relationship. Yeah. I'm using it as a generic term for temporary office space, really flexible office space. Ben? I, uh, I think the only, the, the only thing I'd add is you know, the whole world has been driven down this road of um, hot desking. Um, you know, I've got no interest in sharing my desk with anyone, quite frankly, at the moment, uh, unless you give me a big bottle of hand sanitizer and, and disinfectant spray. Um, so, you know, I think companies will, will, reassess, will reassess how that looks. Um, you know, I think, as Neville says, the, the, the office won't go away. And there are certain things that, that will always want to be done in an office but for example you know events like this one now um hugo would have arranged this in a in a high cost west end hotel um and you know we would have we would have had a buffet after uh, and the thought of the thought of either of those things are are a million miles away from anyone's mind at the moment and i don't really see why they should ever come back um, the thing so, is, you know, there, Ben. Sorry to interrupt, but I mean, it would have been really nice to meet you person to person, and same same with everybody else in the room. There's a, I can see seventy seven participants. I can't even see them. You know, we feel very disassociated with this. The opportunity to mingle, to find out from each other, to get some cross cutting ideas going, perhaps to collaborate in future, to test whether we like people, to have a drink or something to eat with them. This is part of the human condition and something we're desperate for it's we are social creatures so i think we we do need to come back to something more physical i've got tomorrow night a drinks party someone's sending the ingredients and i'm supposed to make it make my own cocktail at home i mean it it doesn't really appeal to me i'm i'm dying to get out and be spend some time with people we have to find a safer way to do that well, i think the point you make on um one-to-one -one is actually very important. I mean, that's my business model effectively, which is, you know, you can be a perfectly average lawyer, but if you're on a one-to-one -one and you make a connection, you get work. And if you do the work competently, you get more work. And I think that is very much going to be quite difficult now for service industries, people who are selling effectively where they're now selling over the internet rather than building up personal rapport. And I think that is going to be a big negative, actually, from working from home, particularly in certain types of industries. Yeah. So I agree. And, and so it's also just socially, think, things can be different. So, you know, we used to talk about work-life balance and work life, you know, what, 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 what's happening there. And I think people have got different perspectives of that. Again, you know, I, mean, I like to try and find the, the positives in things. So when you look at leisure, you could say, well, there's going to be opportunities in leisure because if people won't be socialising at work in the workplace, as Kate says, we're social animals, we're warned to socialise elsewhere. And surely there will be opportunities, therefore, for leisure and social environments in the, in the short term, socially distanced, but probably not in the long term. So yeah, there will there will be opportunities there, and that's where I think you'll see that hopefully the real estate sort of market will will innovate and it'll it'll turn it, it, it sights to, to to where that demand is. I mean, so much of this ultimately goes away if we find a vaccine. Um, you know, a reliable vaccine changes most of this discussion significantly. But we. Just to talk about innovation and how one innovates these days. Um, I've been looking very carefully at uh, shopping malls as a perfect example, where the old concept of a shopping mall is you get in an anchor tenant, somebody really well known, and the rest of the tenants flock in and uh, you have your footfall, etc. cetera. Um, with the internet, even before uh, we have Brexit and COVID, uh, was killing um, the general retail trade, particularly shopping centres, and that applies worldwide, by the way. Um, and America particularly has been looking at very innovative ways of uh, recreating shopping centres and retail by doing joint ventures and making it, for example, a family day out. 
Um, and I think there's going to be a lot more innovation of that type, certainly in the retail trade, because it has to. Um, hospitality is going to be a real problem, I think. Uh, the restaurant trade, you know, where you have to lose 50, 60 percent of your tables in order to um, in order to comply with legislation is going to be a real problem. So which brings me on to a, a series of questions that people have been asking anyway uh, on the attendees, which revolves around how the government is going to step in and possibly alter certain laws, such as the planning laws. Um, will it be easier to convert back to residential? What do you do? Um, how can the government positively intervene here? to improve the scenario, particularly in certain sections that are being hit? I mean, look, I, think it's, um, I think it's a really interesting point, Mark, and one where you know, there's gonna be a lot of thinking, but you know, if, you take, if you take permitted development, for example, over the last few years, uh, lots of local authorities have, have tried to drive away from that because they ended up in a situation where there was not enough office space. Um, so, you know, I think Article 4, was it, in, in, in many local authorities where they are preventing conversion of office to resi, um, that's going to have some thought and, and possibly be needed to be changed again. Um, you know, what do you do with, what, what do you do with the high street that's, that's full of vacant units? Does that go to resi? Um, what happens to Brent Cross? Uh, if uh, if John Lewis if John Lewis decide that that they don't need that site anymore, that's a perfect um, example. Actually, I was talking about that with someone recently. A perfect example. There's a lot of land on the side, you know, there, which can yeah. be utilised. So yeah, Frank Cross, perfect example. As far as planning is concerned, I, I wouldn't underestimate the political how the political scene has changed. You know, if we if if you're thinking January time. Conservative Party thinking, yeah, we're in for, you know, at least two terms and the money they were going to be pushing into the north to, to secure those votes for the next election. And now they must be particularly concerned, given the criticism they're clearly going to get about their, 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 their approach to COVID from, a, from a, a care and health perspective. I would not be surprised but that turns into thinking around planning, um, particularly in, in the north of England and other areas, releasing that to get housing to where it needs to be, to get new hospitals built, um, all those sort of things I suspect may be a focus for them. I'm sorry I'm being a bit cynical that things get done for political reasons rather than general good economic reasons, but uh, I, w I can imagine I absolutely, I can imagine relaxing of, of, of planning if it, if, 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 if it suits those in power. Do you think that would also apply to, I mean, there's been talk about reduction of stamp duty, but I notice only at the lowest yeah. level, the first time entries. Um, will it also, do you think there'll be tax advantages be brought in to make it cheaper and easier to move? Um, will they be reducing corporation tax or something similar. I mean, how's this all going to pan out? Ben? There's, um, sorry, I think there's, uh, you know, there's lots of levers the government can pull and it's got a huge agenda in front of us. I think Neville's absolutely right to say the levelling up agenda is not gone away. If anything, it'll have got worse over the past period. Um, transport's a key way of achieving that, other infrastructure spending, but housing's got to be a very important aspect. Um, anything you can do to employ you know, British labour or open British factories and get the economy going has got to be of interest. And I think post-COVID, post-Brexit, they're going to be having to look at what can we do about the regions and the difference between the regions and London? What can we do about the poor and housing them and giving them jobs? Um, and what can we do to make sure we get re-elected? It's all about politics. Neville, Neville knows that. Um, and they've got a huge, a huge mountain to climb because if they can't get uh, vast taxes out of the, uh, the wealthiest because perhaps they're uh, not thriving as well as they have done, it's very difficult to imagine how we can go forward. I do think there'll be more state intervention. I think the Tories have very much got used to that. Uh, but I think they have to do something very significant to address inequality if they're going to hope to sort of stay in government and have a 
have a reasonable voice uh, that, that appeals to quite a lot of people. Um, and it, you know, it's, it's a very challenging situation. If you're trying to run the country at the moment, what can you do? So in that context, what levers are easy? Well, planning is quite a, an easy one relatively. So I think there will be something uh, reached out for. I think taxation will be another one. Um, interesting for me is what will happen to help to buy, which has really propped up the uh, private property market for uh, quite a long time now, which was going to be phased out in 2023. Um, and large sections of the industry are very, very dependent on that. The most profitable ones, up to 50% dependent on help to buy. And whether that will carry on going forward. I think the government's committed to home ownership, affordable home ownership for people. So it will try and find ways to uh, put, put money into that. I, 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 and actually, whilst my comments were about national government, I think the local government um, arena is going to be absolutely critical of this. Kate, you mentioned earlier about the local authorities. So I'm very involved with Norwood as social care charity for learning disabilities. And, you know, the interaction with the local authorities has, was difficult prior to this. The pressure on local authorities financially is huge. Mm. So what will the local authorities do in order to, because they've got a big part of obviously the planning, what, what will their reaction to be? They need to raise finance. And it also really worries me from a real estate perspective. Some, we all know that these local authorities have started around the country going rather with a wider ambit than they should be around what they would be doing. Now, I'm not sure how that ends up. That may be opportunities for people in the real estate market to, 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 to buy schemes off them, to do different things. So the local authorities and the local government approach to all of this, I think, is going to be critical to I, I wonder also, I mean, if you ask me, do I understand the American market? Yeah, I think I do up to a point. Do I understand parts of Europe? Yep, certainly understand Asia, which I've been working for years. Do I understand what's going on in the north of England? No. And that's a worry to me because, you know, we're very London centric and I suspect a lot of people on this panel and elsewhere the attendees really just look at everything from a London perspective but you know I just simply do not know how bad it is in the north of England in places like that my suspicion is it's very bad anybody want to comment Kate well I come from the north and it is another world People are, you know, have half the incomes that they have in the South and they live a different life. On the other hand, the sort of screaming inequality that we see in London perhaps isn't quite so evident and the perhaps isn't quite the resentment that there can be in, in the city, in London. Um, but yeah, I think we only see what's under our nose. A lot of us here are talking about our personal experience today, inevitably. Um, but, you know, a lot of Tories have been elected in the north of England, in northern constituencies, and they have to have a voice at some time. The government, I think, is being run at the moment by a very small group of rather inexperienced people. And I do worry about their ability to have the foresight to take us through Brexit, to do some levelling up and to get Britain's sort of position in the world um, guaranteed in a situation where the world pressures between America, China in particular are extremely concerning and uh, it makes me, although like Neville I'm an optimist and I want to have a you know, good future for myself, children and grandchildren, it does feel that there's a lot of uh, clouds gathering at the moment and we need some competent political leadership to take us through this um, business and people who are, who are able, such as the people on this panel, um, international uh, cooperation such as Hugo represents these are our countervailing tendencies that can help us so I think you know business coming to the fore doing the right thing say, saying what they need and, and fighting for that empowering people uh, including our own customers and also working where possible with uh, international friends and collaborators yeah. can help us. I mean an interesting aspect from a London perspective is that of course London's been a hub for foreign nationals to come. I mean, you know, my, one of my partners, Nathaniel, is a Frenchie, right? And spent time 
educated here in the US and coming here now. Well, that's what's going to happen to that market. Are, are we going to be able to attract, you know, the international? I hope so because I think one of the best things about London is international and multicultural sort of diversity we have. What's going to happen? I, I hope that doesn't stop for sure. Um, so, who knows? A lot of uncertainty. All right. Um, I want to sort of sweep up since we're now hitting 10 o'clock, which is like the witching hour, and uh, we have to go back to our virtual offices at some stage. Um, it's interesting. I've been looking at a number of the questions that have been raised. Um, some of them we've already covered about the WeWork came up. Um, there was a good point, actually, about the advent of 5G and how that's going to revolutionise uh, greater connectivity wherever you are. Um, we've covered the various types of work that people are looking to or to invest in. Um, somebody's made the point on valuations coming back on property and to what levels and how cautious the surveyors are going to be in valuing. Um, Very cautious. Yeah, very cautious, um, particularly as there's always the risk of being sued on the back of them at the end of the day, if it all goes belly up. Um, and then some chat points as well. We covered stamp duty. Uh, we've covered the workforce moving and shifting to a slightly different environment and a different balance. Um, somebody's made in the chat, uh, uh, saying that the government can still take advantage of this awful COVID management and can still make positive uh, things that may come out of this. Maybe I've misread that one. Um, and then somebody is saying they're actually on the board of a, of a UK vaccine company and they've got every confidence there's a vaccine on the horizon. At one o'clock, I'll see you then. <laughs> so... Hello. I've got to, I've got another meeting to go to in a moment. Okay, so we're going to sweep now, sweep up. Um, I'd like to thank the panelists uh, a lot for taking their time and um, for their interesting views. I'd like to thank uh, uh, everybody who's worked hard to try and uh, get this uh, discussion group together. They know who they are, and um, I think I'd like to offer Hugo the opportunity very briefly. Just to finish up, because UK Israel uh, is part of uh, the discussion and they're part of the group that's funded this. Uh, Hugo? Well, thank you very much, Mark, and thank you to our panelists for joining and also to all of you for attending. Um, I'll be very, very brief. I mean, I think Kate made a point earlier about the physical aspects of these events not being the same. We're finding that, but we're continuing to do events like this and so look out for more like this and one of the other subjects that was touched on was that of innovation and certainly from an Israeli perspective and Kate and Ben have been to Israel with us and seen a number of different companies that are innovating across the whole spectrum from care homes to supply chain and so forth so these are things that we're very happy if you're in that area and looking for new innovations to put you in touch with to give you ideas so do get in touch with us um, if we can help in that area because there's a lot of really interesting technology out there from Israel that can actually help in a number of these areas so thank you all very much for joining and i hope you found this informative and thank you to mark and to forsters as well for um sponsoring and being a partner on this okay thank you very much all of you have a good day